time that we have left today because we need to finish problems six through 15. So I'm going to go ahead and start. But first, I did change the wording on the problems in the test. So if you're in the review, add that. If you're working on the review and then you happen to give it another attempt, um, you might notice that it has like different stuff in here. Like when I changed thousand to thousand, right? Which is the correct wording. <laughs> so I did it when I well, I created the test too. And when I created the test, I did make sure that it had the thousand. Um, and then also I added this statement because when y'all were doing it over here. Oh, you can't hide. What happened? Okay, let's try this again. And he, see, it changed it to extend it. He said something about it, like going back. I submitted your terms and thing on. I should have remembered. Oh, you see me now? <laughs> okay, so let me minimize this real quick and go back to that. Okay, so I changed the thousand to thousand on all the problems that one does to around the nearest thousand. It didn't even have a TH right when you knew that was wrong. Um, but then in the evaluation step, when I was grading, I was counting the evaluation step as a calculus error. And I had some pushback from an online student, not a student in this class, or the remote class. But in the online version, they were like, well, it's an evaluation step, that's arithmetic. So it should be an arithmetic error. And I was like, yeah, arithmetic is involved. But the evaluation step is the application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's a calculus concept, not an arithmetic concept. You plugging in your upper bound first, then plugging your second bound, your lower bound second, and then taking that difference, right? That is the application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. I need to see that step. If you decide to type it in the calculator after you've written that down, by all means, go for it. But what I don't want to see is you tell me what the integral is, you have the bounds there, and then all of a sudden you say the answer is 5.5. That you're missing the that fundamental theorem of calculus step. Okay. Um, and you'll notice, like when I do it, if I put it on my camera real quick, this is what I'm referring to. So you'll do the integration and you'll get that. And then all of a sudden people just tell me this is the answer. And you're missing that main calculus concept that you learned in Cal 1 at the end of Cal 1, but it wasn't in Cal 1. And that says you should be plugging in the upper bound, putting a subtraction, and then plugging in your lower bound. Now, if you choose to use a calculator after that, like the whole thing, that's totally okay. But as long as I see that application of the fundamental theorem of calculus, okay, I need to see that step, and then you're totally okay to give me the final answer. Okay, because I know it doesn't say in the instructions that you can't type all this stuff in your calculator. It says you totally can. Okay, so just show this step first, and then use the calculator. I use the calculus least amount as possible, but that's just me personally. Okay. You can go from here to here. Now, this is number six of my work done because I have to have the answers on the side. Not because I need them to do the problems, but just because I want to make sure we didn't make any errors along the way. And then we got the exact value that we're supposed to end up with. Okay. So for number six, let me go write that one down. It was this one. So we have zero to pi over 16. Kind of already know what the answer is gonna be, but we're gonna work our way to get there. So I just wanted to mention that. And I also, I kind of mentioned it briefly um, to Rebecca, but I have graded the online classes test. They took them and so I graded them uh, last night and this morning. And I will give, I mean, that's what benefits you guys, I guess, when they take it earlier, is that I kind of have some ideas of like where people are, are having their mishaps, so I can kind of warn you, clear warn you. Um, the biggest problem I had was people not following the directions. So it tells you exactly what you need to do on some of the problems. Like this one says you must use integration by parts, right? This one says you must use integration by parts, but it says you must use the tabular method. So if you see that and you're not doing the tabular method, you're doing the repeated uh, integration by parts formula over and over and over and over until it doesn't go no more, then that's not following the instructions, okay? So make sure that you're following those instructions because it's a difference between the six points versus one point. 
for not following the directions, right? Then you lose all five points on a problem that's worth 10 points. That's not okay. So make sure you keep that in the back of your mind as you go through these, okay? There's another one, the Wallace's formula. Somebody didn't use Wallace's formula and just started going at it like the same way we're gonna kind of go with this one, number six. But you can't because that one specifically tells you to use Wallace's formula, okay? Um, and then the big one is there's a problem like this on the test and it can, you can use use substitution to find the answer. It's possible. However, because it literally tells you to use trigonometric substitution, you should not be doing it use of. If you do use of on the side, you might not even get the same answer or not, like to check, that's totally okay. But what I'm grading is not your new substitution. I'm grading, did you apply the trigonometric substitution correctly? Okay. So, and then if, if when you see the test, it's the only problem that asks for trigonometric substitution. So I can't tell whether or not you learned it or not properly, unless you actually do it that way. Okay, so you won't get, you get one point <laughs> for the work part if you do not do the trig substitution. So make sure you pay attention to those um, directions, please do this. And then this one is one that it's not exactly like this, but kind of like that. See how you have x, right? If you were to let u equal 49 plus x squared, du would be 2x. And you have the x. You would just need to put in a one half when you incorporate du. So this problem could totally be done with u substitution. But because of the direction saying to use trig substitution, don't use the u substitution. Okay. It's totally okay to do it, like to check, but don't do it as your actual solution, okay? Um, and then these steps too, I also noticed when the students took it online, is it literally tells you to show the decomposition, show the integration, and show your applying your fundamental theorem of calculus, the evaluation part, right? Um, and I'll have students that are not showing me how they're doing the decomposition. They don't show me what they get after they integrate. They're just giving me the breakout of the two fractions, and then they're giving me the answer. And that's not okay. Okay, I need to see all of your calculus or all the stuff you've been learning along the way. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go through them and I'll you'll have examples on a paper of how we should be doing this, especially when it comes to that decomp, because it kind of go, went over how to do it in the calculator. I'll show you what I need on paper to go with that calculator usage. Okay. So for this one, we're definitely going to use our rules for um, sine. Now, if the sine had an odd exponent, then I would peel out one of those signs and then convert the remaining signs to cosines, okay? But my exponent here is not odd, it's even. So I cannot do that, okay? When it's even, your only option is to do the power reducing formulas, okay? So the first thing I would do for me personally is I rewrite this as sine squared of four theta squared, right? Because when you square square, you end up with a fourth power. Then I would apply my power reducing formula inside that bracket. And so I would get one minus cosine of two theta. And it doesn't mean two theta, just a random theta. Two theta is whatever the angle was before. So since my angle was four theta, when I double that angle here, it's actually gonna be eight theta. Professor, for the integration part, should it be pi over 16 or pi over six? And then I don't know what calculator, I'm guessing that somebody was using the calculator they're not supposed to. I think it was two people in my class because they just went from here to the answer. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> How do you go from there to the answer? There's like a lot going on in here. So it, it just mind boggled me. What was going on? Professor, can you hear us? I cannot hear you guys. So let me see. Um. What did I do the last one? Oh, I know what I did. I edited my speaker. Okay, can someone try to say something now? Can you hear me now? 
Hey, yes, now I can hear you. Did y'all have a question? I did. I was trying to ask if it was actually supposed to be pi over 16 or pi over 6 when you were writing, just to make sure that I have my notes correct. Oh, yes, yes. And I wrote it right the first time. Oh, yeah, I see your copy now. Um, but I did write it correct the second time, right? I did it correct there, and then all of a sudden here, and then here I did it. It's a good catch. Thank you. No, it will have, it will make an effect later, thing. right? <laughs> I just Say do the again. same thing because I, I think I actually texted you one day on one of the homework problems. You were like, Trevor, you somehow got this from here. Um, right, right. So. Yes, it happens. It happens. <laughs> I'm telling you, when I take my own test, I have to like double, triple, quadruple, double check every single line because I'm, I'm guilty of it so much. So, <laughs> so let's go ahead and keep going. Um, now, I will square this, but we'll kind of like square the numerator and the denominator separately, right? So when I square the numerator, it's going to be basically boiling out this. So this guy times himself, right? Now, some people could just do it. I'm going to write out what I'm doing. Two squared is just four. And it's OK if you go from here to here. That's OK. Some people could do it. I just don't want to make too many mistakes. So I'm going to go ahead and do it piece by piece. So I'll get one and then negative cosine, another negative cosine, so negative two cosine. And then negative and negative will give me positive cosine squared, but the same equal. Okay. Then from there, I'm going to do two steps in one. So I'm going to take the one fourth since everything is divided by four. I'm just going to put the one fourth outside. But then I'm also going to separate. Um, no, I'm not. I'm going to leave it alone as an integral. But I'm going to edit one of those terms because this term right here needs to require us to apply that power reducing formula again. Okay. Because you can't integrate cosine squared. You can integrate cosine, but not cosine squared. So if I use the power reducing formula here, remember whatever that angle was gets doubled. So this one will be 16 theta. So let's see, we have one minus two cosine of eight theta. And if I split this fraction, it's one over two and then cosine of 16 theta over two. Now here's where I'm gonna split my integral. So I do have like terms, don't I? We have a new orange pin. So I'm gonna try this one out. Those two are like terms, right? They're just constants. So if I combine those two guys together, I'm gonna to get three halves. Then I'm gonna put my two out here. Forget my one again. Eight theta. And then the last term, I'm gonna kick the one half out. Then I have cosine of 16 theta, and there should be a d theta in there. I just can't squeeze it in my paper. And then there should be a big bracket at the end, right? Because that one fourth is going to multiply by all of these terms. Okay. So when I split the integral for all those terms, I have to remember that the one fourth gets multiplied by all of them. Okay. Now we can actually apply our integration. However, I don't need to see the u substitution if you know how to do it and how to apply it. However, if you are going to throw in u, this is another thing that I saw people doing on the test. They just started, some people were using t, and they must have got that from somewhere else, not from my videos, because I use u all the time. Um, but if you're going to use a different variable, right, that wasn't in the original problem, you have to define what that variable is. 
you can't just start using you and I don't even know what you is or what DU is and you've never established what you or DU was. So you can't just throw in things. You have to like define like this is you, this is DU and then use them, okay? Um, I'm gonna do the use substitution just cause I always like to show it. But if you can go from here to the answer, that is okay. As long as you know that eventually you're gonna have to divide by eight, right? And if you do the integral of this, you're eventually going to have to divide by 16. That's essentially what happens in the end. Okay. But I'm going to show the substitution. So for this um, middle integral, I'm going to make u equal to 8 theta. And so then du would be this guy's derivative, which is just 8 with a d theta. Over here on this integral, I'm not going to use u because I don't want to get confused. I'm going to use V. So V is 16 theta, and then DV would be 16 D theta. And I have D theta, but I don't have the 16. Same thing here. I have D theta, but I don't have the 8. So what we can do is replace the D theta with DU over 8. Similarly for this, we can replace D theta with db over 16. And we're just taking that equation and dividing both sides by eight, and the pink one dividing both sides by 16, right? So I have to see this before you start using u and v. Now, if you choose to integrate it without using u and v, you're just doing u and v in your mind, that's okay as long as it's correct, right? So I'm not gonna integrate this one just yet, even though it's pretty easy, it's just three half theta. I'm gonna wait until I integrate all of them and then I'll integrate this one. And some of you do it like half and half and that's okay too. It's okay, not wrong. I also don't change my bounds when I use u sub, it's okay to do. Again, that's okay if you do, just as long as it's done correctly, right? And then we're going to have du over v. Oh, not you. Instead of going to use v. And then dv over 16. And now I can fit it all in there. So I'm closing the bracket. So from here, I'll actually integrate. So I get three halves theta minus two over eight. I'm gonna leave it like that, even though I could probably reduce it. And the integral of cosine is negative sine plus one half times this one over 16. And then the integral of cosine is negative sine. And then I do still have to evaluate this for theta equal to zero to pi over 16. And then we can back up. This one already had thetas. I'm gonna leave that alone for just now. I will eventually mess with it, but for now, actually a negative times positive. Negative. And V was 16 data. Okay. Now, again, you can go from here to here if you know how. Okay. So this one's not hard, right? We know it's going to be 3 pi theta. This one, though, if you integrate cosine, you get negative sine. So this negative with a negative sine is why it's positive. And then you're going to have to divide by that 8 as part of the substitution, right? So that's why we ended up with the two over the eight. Same thing over here, we know that the integral of cosine is gonna be negative sine. So instead of a positive, it's gonna to turn to negative. And then you would have to divide by 16, which with that two down there, it's gonna make 32, right? And you have sine of 16 theta. So if you know how to go from here to here, that's totally okay. Just for me, for instructional purposes, I'm going to write these steps both here in class and when you see the solutions to the text. Okay. 
their info just because I want to lay it all out so you can see where what's happening there. But if you do go from here to here correctly, I, I understand what's happening. I just don't want you using U's and B's or T or whatever letter you throw in without actually defining what those letters are. Okay. Do you have questions? Oh, oh. See? Okay, we're almost there. We've got our integral. Now I just need to apply that um, fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So I'm going to plug in pi over 16 here. That's going to give me 3 pi over 32. I'll change that to a 1 fourth. And when I take 8 times pi over 16, it's going to simplify to pi over 2. And when I take pi over 16 and I plug it in there, it's going to simplify to just pi. Now, when I plug in zero here, it's just going to be zero. I'm going to simplify this. And when I multiply eight times zero, it's going to be zero. And when I multiply 16 times zero, it's going to be zero. So I've applied the fundamental theorem of calculus. I simplified the little angles. I simplified this in one step, but it's fine. You could totally type all of this in your calculator. However, personally, I know that the sine of zero is zero, so I don't even have a need to type in the second half of the problem in my calculator. So I'm only going to be typing in that top, this first one. And I don't even need to simplify that. I mean, you can if you want to, but it's not necessary. So I'm gonna do one over four parentheses, 3 pi over 32 plus 1 over 4. Is it sine of pi over 2? Close my parentheses, minus 1 over 32. Sine of pi. And then close my big parentheses from when I open the parentheses with a 1 fourth. And it tells me it's 0 0.1361 dot dot dot, which if I round to the nearest thousand, I get 0 0.136. That is not. Oh, I know why. So I have an error on my paper, not here. <laughs> I'll show you where my error is. This is what I have here on my paper. 2 times 16 is 2 times 16. Oh, I don't know. Is 2 times 16 times 4? It is 128. Hmm. That would be 128. That would be 16. That would be 128 as well. Oh, I see my error. I integrated cosine. And what is the integral of cosine? Uh huh. What do I have? <laughs> so that's not on what we did today. That was my own past. So let me circle this because when I come back, I need to correct that. Okay. And this is the answer that's in the, the review. So if you type in this, it'll tell you it's correct. If you type in whatever the heck I had over here, it's incorrect. Okay. okay, so that one was number six. It had to do with a power reducing formula and we actually needed to use it twice, right? So keep that in mind. Um, and this was from chapter, this or, one, good question. This one's from 8.3. Yes, this one's from 8.3. So it's the trig section, but just the trig manipulation section, not the trig substitution section. That was a different section. So we're just manipulating what we have using all the trig formulas. 
we're not introducing triangles and behavior. So let's see what number seven looks like. So number seven is nice. Number seven asks us to use Wallace's theorem. So make sure it says that, that that's what you're doing. So if I take this one, Wallace's theorem, I think with the odd power, that's the one where you have to multiply by pi over two, but I'm going to go confirm. Okay, yes. No, when n is odd, you do not have the pi over two multiplier. It's only when n is even that you have the pi over two multiplier. So I'm gonna have to use this top formula. And since my power is seven, my denominator should be seven, and then the numerator would be one less, which is six. So that's really just these three fractions then, okay? Don't write these three fractions and then another six over seven, because that dot, dot, dot just means you continue this pattern until you get to that specific term, okay? But since my n is seven, I would already get to the six over seven just with these first three factors, okay? So when I go on my paper, I'm only going to say 2 over 3 times 4 over 5 up until I get to my exponent at the denominator and then one less at the numerator. You only go until that, okay? So if my power was a 5, then I would only have these two terms, and that's it. If my power was a 3, I'd only have that one term. If my power was a nine, then my next factor would have been eight over nine, okay? So you only go use that formula up until you get to the term with the correct uh, exponent. Now, somebody had done that on one of the tests. They had six over seven or whatever it was. I don't even think it was six over seven, but then they had another one. And I was like, no, no, no. That other bubble just tells you like how far it goes. <laughs> it doesn't tell you to actually multiply by another one. Okay. Well, that, that, that just means you keep going until you get to this guy. Okay. So when I multiply all of these, I can do these in the calculator, kind of reduce them by hand, but I'm not going to. Oops. And we get 16 over 35. It doesn't say it wants like a decimal or something. Seven. It does say it wants a decimal. So we'll go back, hit the double arrow, and it's this guy. And since I have to round to the nearest thousand, it would be 0 0.457. And that would be what you type in. I have room for number eight. And this one's also an 8.3 problem. So if you wanted to find more examples, right, go to the 8.3 section and you can find strings. If you're looking in the homework section, you can just click like try another, try another, try another, right? Okay, this one's the same section. I over six, yes. I over three, still 8.3. And we have the square root of tangent. And then we have secant to the fourth power. So this one I'm gonna talk out for sure. Um, if we look at this one, because of the radical, you kind of already should be thinking, I should be letting you equal tangent, okay? Because it's inside the house. But if you did that, then du would be whatever the derivative of tangent is, which is secant squared x. So I have a secant squared, I just have an extra secant squared, right? So what we'll do is we'll 
kind of separate this into secant squared x and secant squared x. And we'll keep one of them for the du. So I know what to replace with du. But this other one needs to get converted into tangents so that I can now have everything in terms of u. Okay. So when I write my next step, that's what I'm going to do. I keep this guy, and actually, I'm going to write him as tangent to the one half exponent. And this secant squared that I do not have circled is the one that's going to get converted. Hold on, sine squared is cosine squared equals one. So it's um, tangent squared plus one equals secant squared. Okay. I just had to do that because I don't memorize. You know, I didn't want to scroll up and then review. <laughs> so I just do it on the side. Okay. This other one that I circled, that one's going to go over here on the side so that it will eventually get replaced with the DU. Okay. So then tan everywhere I see tangent is going to become the u. So this is u to the one half power. This is going to be u being squared plus one. And then this guy becomes the du. And we've used all of our conversion there. And then from there, it's just integrating that. Again, I don't change my bounds, but if you wanted to, you could. It's just up to you. I'd rather sub and then back sub and then put my bounds in. Some people just like to change the bounds and then plug them in after the integrate. It's a choice that you choose. Um, so if I multiply these two, I'm going to have to add their exponents, which is going to give me u to the five halves. And then if I multiply one times anything, it's just going to be that exact same thing. And then of course I have my u. Now I will apply my power rule. So I'll get u five halves plus one is seven halves. And then I divide by seven halves or multiply by the reciprocal. Keep one half plus one is three halves and then divide or multiply by the reciprocal. And then I still have to evaluate, but I can't just get because those those numbers work for x, right? Not for u. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna put in what I had. It should be 10x for u. And then 10x again for u. And then I'll be able to evaluate it from pi over three. So I've done all of the breakdown, right? I've actually shown the integral, and then now we need to do that fundamental theorem of calculus. So we're just plugging in the numbers, and then I'll go to the calculator. How many parentheses? Two sevens tangent of pi over six now raise seven halves plus two thirds tangent pi over six raise the three halves. Ah, I got it in there. And then from there, I'm definitely going to do my calculus. So let's see. Um, and I'm literally going to type in everything exactly the way it is, parentheses and all. So parentheses, two over seven, tangent of pi over three, close it. Oh, I forgot this parentheses. There we go, because I want to give it that exponent, right? Raised to the seven halves. 
now we get down plus two over three parentheses tangent pi over three. Now your calculator can get overloaded parentheses power. So I think I'm actually going to split this. Oops, wait. See, it's, it's, it's too much for my calculator to do. This is what happens when I try to put three over two, it has this little weird box, like a checker box. That's when your calculator is not going to take anything else. And I can't leave it as a three, right? It has to be a three halves power. So unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to evaluate each term individually, and then we'll be able to put it all together. Or the alternative is to actually figure out what tangent of pi thirds is. And then once you have these smaller numbers, you'll have more um, input spots to type this in your calculator. I think I might do that actually. So let's see, 10 of pi over three is square root of three. So I have two over seven, and then I have the square root of three to the seven halves. That's gonna save me quite a few keys when I try to enter this in the calculator. That's the same thing. So it's square root of three again, but to the three halves. And if I wanna get rid of these big, big parentheses, I'm just gonna distribute this minus. So minus two sevenths times something, and then minus two thirds times something. What is tangent of pi over six? It is square root of three over three raised to the seven halves, and then square root of three over three raised to the three halves. Now this I should be able to write down. Two over seven. Square to three, seven halves, plus two over three, square to three, raised to the three halves, minus two over seven, fraction, square to three, over three, raised to the seven halves. And minus two over three parentheses fraction square root three raised. Oh no, it doesn't like it. See how I have my box already? So we'll be the last term for last. I'm just gonna delete all this. It won't let me fit my last last term in there. I just found out instead of a and then the fractional key of the exponents where it has to mess up boxes at the end, like it's all over. Mm -hmm. You just put the division like real symbol. Oh, okay, okay, cool. I'm going to do minus two over three. Actually, minus two over three. Square root of three. You hit this button, divide by two. Yeah, for the exponent. Okay, so we got about 3.13, and this two is not going to change the nine. So it's just 3.13. And this one I think would have to be. Okay, now we'll finally get into eight point four, which is the trig so That one's probably, I think, it's one of the harder ones of all of this stuff. Is the trig so It's not too bad. It's still a more challenging one. Let me grab number nine, and then go inside that. So for number nine, we have. 16, 17, x cubed, and then x squared minus 16 dx. So again, it does say we have to use trig substitution. So we're going to go ahead and do that. 
I think I need to go back to the computer because I need to make sure we're trying what I need, right? So let's go back. We have our variable squared minus a constant squared inside the radical. Always look inside your radical, see which case you have. So my variable squared minus, here we go. We have this case here, case three. Now remember, you have to decide whether or not your, your variables are greater than your constant, okay? So in my case, my variable here was X and my constant, because it was 16, what squared is 16? Four, right? So the A is four. So my variable is X, my constant is four in this case. So are my variables gonna be greater than four? If you look at the bounds, the bounds were from 16 to 17, weren't they? And those X values are greater than four. So you should be using this top case when it comes to substituting something for the back. Okay. Very rarely do we ever get that bottom situation. Okay, so I'm going to write this down. I'm not going to write the U and the A. I'm going to write X instead of U, and I'm going to write 4 instead of A. So on the side of my paper, I'm going to write, instead of U equal to A secant theta, I'm going to write X equals 4 secant theta. And instead of writing the radical equals A tan theta, I'm going to write that my radical equals 4 tan theta. And then I'm going to do my triangle with X's instead of U's. So this set of U would be an X instead of A, it would be a 4. And then over here, you have that radical. The only thing that it doesn't tell me, I don't understand why the, the, those little things don't tell you it. Well, I guess I understand why it doesn't take that because it depends on what A is. No, still should. <laughs> we don't know what DX is. So in order for me to find DX, I have to actually take that equation at the top and do the derivative of both sides, right? And that's how I'll figure out what DX is. So the derivative of X is just one DX or DX. The derivative of four secant theta is actually four secant theta tangent theta. And of course you have to tag on D theta. That's the only part that it doesn't tell you and it should, because it should literally say DU would equal, oh, I know what this is. Because what if you, what if this part in here that was being squared was, what if it was like this, right? then the derivative wouldn't be just a constant multiplier. It would be something else, okay? And then this part wouldn't be just the x, it'd be like a whole thing, right? So that's why they don't tell you what it is. You have to find the x. Don't forget to find the x. <laughs> you can't just say dx is d theta. And I have had people do that. not just on this third test, but even in the past test, I've had people just say, well, dx is du, and I'm like, oh, no, it's not. It depends on what you let x be or what you let u be. That's how you find d. So I have all the pieces I need because I know what to substitute for x, right? I know what to substitute for this radical guy, and I know what to substitute for the dx. So we're just gonna plug everybody in, all their conversions. So instead of x cubed, you're going to have 4 secant theta b cubed. Instead of the radical, we're going to have 4 tangent theta. And instead of dx, we're going to have 4 secant theta tangent theta d theta. And we really have to look to see what we have to figure out what to do next. Because either secants are going to get converted into tangents or tangents are going to get converted into secants. But what direction do we go in? We kind of have to figure out what we got so far. So if I multiply 4 to the power of 3, that's going to be 64. Times 4 times 4. I have no idea. 64 times 4 times 4 is this really huge number. So, okay, it's so what it is. And if I have secant cubed and another secant, I have secant to the fourth power. 
and I have tangent and tangent, so that's going to be tangent squared. Now, because the secant has an even exponent, okay, we're going to convert everything into tangents. So the idea is, is that u will be tangent, and then du would be secant squared theta d theta. Okay. So that means this guy's going to get split up again, right? It's going to get split up into two secants, two secant squareds. And one of them's going to get saved for du, but the other one's going to get converted into tangents. And I can kick out that tangent force. I'm going to try to switch it out there. So this one is going to become tangent squared theta plus one. This one, I'm going to put it on the side. So tan squared theta is next. And then the extra secant squared theta. And then d theta. So everything's all aligned, right? For, for me to do the use of. So this is going to be u squared plus one times u squared, and then all of that will become du. From here, it's not so, so bad. We'll distribute our u squared. So we have u to the fourth plus u squared, and then we'll do our power rule. So we get u to the fifth over five, plus u to the cube over three. And we can't plug in our bounds. Those bounds were for x. So we've got two back substitutions to do. One back substitution is the pink, right? I gotta get back into thetas. And then the last back substitution is to go from thetas to x's. Okay, so we've got two substitutions to reverse. So first, let's go back. U was tangent, right? So this is tangent theta raised to the fifth power. I'll write it like that. And then tangent theta raised to the third power but I'm not quite ready for those bounds yet because those are X's. Now here's where it gets a little bit weird. We have to plug in something for tangent, okay? And it's going to get raised to the fifth power, whatever tangent is. Something again for tangent and over three. Now, this one we got lucky because we don't have to necessarily look at the triangle, although we could. Tangent is what? Tangent theta with respect to a um, triangle is always going to be opposite over adjacent. Okay. And if I go look at that triangle on orange, the opposite is the radical. And the adjacent is four. So both of these tangents, I'm going to replace with this fraction. Okay. You could have also noticed that here, if I would have just divided both sides by four in this statement, I would have gotten the same relationship, right? Up here, if I would have divided both sides by four, I would have figured out the tangent was the radical of four. Okay. So but not always can you go back to one of these two statements. So that's why it's kind of important to learn how to use the triangle because not all of them. If I would have gotten a sign somehow, like how am I gonna do that, right? There's no signs here in the, the, in the definition. So let's see, we're gonna do square root of x squared minus 16 over four, square root of x squared minus 16 over four, and I'm gonna go from 16 to 17. Now you could try to manipulate this, but I'm not gonna waste more test time right trying to do that. 
So if I plug in 17, 17 squared minus 16 happens to be 273 over 4 to the fifth power over 5. And it's actually the square root of this thing. Then if I were to plug in 16, 16 squared minus 16 is 240 over, oh, I'm doing it too much. Uh, I need to plug in 17 into both of these terms first, right? Then we can plug in 16. So all of that I plugged in 70. Now we can plug in the 60. So we get 240. And then 240. Now I don't know. Let me see. I'm trying to think of how much I'll be able to put in this calculator. I think I'll try to do each fraction and see if it simplifies it. So one big fraction, and then in my numerator, I'm gonna do parentheses fraction, square root of two, seven, three, over four, close the parentheses, raise to the fifth power, divide by five. So I tried doing that, I don't know if you can see what's in my calculator. I tried just typing in this guy and it gave me that. Okay. Now I can leave that there because I can call upon it later. I'm not even going to write the rest of the number. So I'm just going to use my calculator. Now I'm going to go back up there and I'm going to change the power to a three and I'm going to change the denominator to a three. And I get this. I don't even need that. Anymore. I'll recall that number when I need it. Here I'm going to distribute my minus. So minus and then minus. And it's going to be the same fraction as I had up there, but instead of 273, it's going to be 240 inside the house. So 240. And then for the cube, it's going to be the same, but I need to change that to a 3 and the exponent to a 3. They get 19 points or something. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go all the way up till I get to this 240 number. Then I'm going to say plus, and I'm going to go up to the 23. I'm going to hit enter just because that's a lot of digits for the calculator. Then I'm going to hit minus. Oops, I passed the 174. And then minus the 19. Now that's what I get inside this bracket. But inside this bracket, it has to get multiplied by that 1024. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to do times 1024. And I get seven two zero four four point. That nine is going to change this five, so it's five five six. And I know that's a big number, but it is correct. Okay. I just did a whole bunch of weird stuff over here. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> Shouldn't you also like you say square root on the top so they don't do that? What do you mean? Like right as five halves? What do you mean? So like uh since the 17 squared just made it 17 and the square root the 16. So it would be 17 times four. No, you cannot. There, we've talked about that before. I told you that when you have this, you can do that, right? But when you have this, or if it's a minus, you cannot apply the power to both. 
So remember what a square root is. A square root is this to the power of one half. And since you're not allowed to apply that power to both of them, you cannot square root each term individually. Okay. Good question, though, because there are people that try. <laughs> and if you did, you just wouldn't get this number at the end. Because okay. it's not the same, it's not equivalent. And you would get most of the points, especially if you're doing this and then you're writing this out. You get most of the points, but you'd have arithmetic error in there, right? Actually, that's an algebraic error. Okay. This is probably one of the longest problems. Okay, number 10. How are we doing on time? We have one hour. We got through four of them, so we need to try to hurry up this thing. Some of the other ones might not be as long. Okay, this one also requires substitution, and this one. So I'll try to do it, but try to do it like just make it faster, not too fast, right? Just because I want to try to make sure we cover all of them. Um, or if anything, no, it's the back stuff that's the weird part. I'm going to say I can do the substitution and then stop right there, and then you guys can finish it, but it's the back stuff that's the weird part. So this was a good one, number 10. Um, I'm gonna go back to the cases. So we'll need those. So ours is 49 plus X squared inside the house. So ours is actually like case two, okay? Where you have the constant squared plus your variable squared. Now in my case, because it's 49 plus X squared, the a is seven and the u is just x. So I'm gonna do the same conversion on my paper, but I'm going to use x for u and seven for a. Okay. So we have that my variable is x equal to seven tangent theta. And then my radical It's going to be seven secant theta and I think they labeled the, to not the bottom one, the constant. Yes. So this is where the seven is going to go. This is where the variable is going to go. And then this is where the house goes. We just don't have dx, right? We know what to plug in for x, we know what to plug in for the radical, but we don't know what to plug in for dx. So again, take your first equation and just take the derivative of both sides. So the derivative of x is one dx. The derivative of seven tan theta is seven secant squared theta, and then tag on the d theta. Now we know what to replace everybody with. So this will be seven tan theta. The radical will be seven secant theta. And then dx will be seven secant, let's take a moment there, secant squared theta, d theta. So 343, seven times seven times seven, yes. Now I have secant to the third power, and then I have tangent theta. So when secant is even, you put one all to the side, right? But my secant is odd, okay? When my secant is odd, you're only gonna kick one of them out, and then you actually let u equal secant, and then du would be secant tangent. So if I split that up, 
is going to be secant squared theta times secant theta. And then if I do my u sub, I could say u is secant, and then du would be the derivative of secant, which is secant tangent. Okay. So I have what I need for du, and then this guy will just become u squared. Get u squared and then du. Which is u cubed over three. And then I'm going to kick out the three. These don't reduce. And it's u cubed. Well, what was u? U was secant, right? So it's actually secant cubed. And we do have a relationship up here for secant, right? If I just divide both sides by seven, I get that secant is the radical over seven. But it's going to be cubed. So I get my radical 49 plus x squared over seven cubed. You can try to simplify that, or you can just plug in the square root of 15 of zero. It's up to you how you want to do it. If I cube this and I cube that, 7 cubed is 343, so they're going to cancel. I'm going to end up with 49 plus x squared to the 3 halves over just 3. Right? If I cube this 7, 343 cancels with this 43, and the square root and a cube turn into power three halves. Three for the exponent, half for the radical. So now we do the fundamental theorem of calculus. When I square 15, it's just going to become, when I square the square root of 15, it's just going to be 49 plus 15, which is 64 to the three halves over three. When I plug in zero, it's just going to be 49 to the three halves over three. That is small enough for me to type the whole thing in the calculator. I think I got it all in there. Looks like what it looks like on the paper. Well, that's not what it asked for. It asked for decimals, right? So 56.123. And the fourth one isn't going to change the other one. So it should stay like that. That's good. What's going on There's so much air. I don't think it's fine. <laughs> it's everywhere. Trying to get it all on the screen. I remember these are from 8.4, right? Number nine as well is from 8.4. I know I'm not going to be able to squeeze number 11 because number 11 is another use of. So I'm not going to be able to squeeze it in this little space. So I'm just going to go grab another paper. It will not fit in there. Okay. Number 11 is another use of, so it'll also be from 8.4. But that one is um, 0 to 5. And then the square root of 100 minus 4x squared. Now, I have seen people do this problem in two different ways. And I think we even did one like this in class, where I mentioned to you that you could do it two different ways. Okay. If you can factor something in common here and then take that out of the radical, fantastic. 
If you can, it's just stuff like that, okay? But in this case, I actually can. In this case, I can factor out a four from these two terms, right? And that would just be 25 minus x squared. And then because it's multiplied, this four is multiplied by that whole thing, I can apply the power to both, right? That's this situation. You have two things that are multiplied together, you can apply the power to both. So I can apply this one half exponent or this radical to the four and this guy. What I can't do is apply the radical to 25 and x squared individually, okay? But I can do it to just the four and the whole thing in parentheses. So it will become the square root of four and then the square root of these two terms. And then that guy's just a two, which I'm gonna kick out. And then that helps when I go to set my little triangle. Um, it's not as complicated. Otherwise, I would have had to have used 10 for A, and I would have had to have used 2x for U, okay? But now, my A is 5, and my U is just x. And it's a little less confusing that way, okay? But if we look inside of our radical to figure out which case we have, we have our constant squared minus our variable squared. And I think just because I wanted to make sure I had all three cases in the review, so that no matter which one you got on the test, you have seen it before, um, it should be case one. But sure enough, when I confirm, you do have your constant squared minus your variable squared. So it will be, in my case, x equals five sine theta. So let me write that here. So x equals five sine theta, and then the radical uh, 25 minus x squared will be five cosine theta, and then my little triangle will have not a, a is five. So it'll have five, and then x, and then the radical here. So we'll go ahead, oh, we can't, we don't know what dx is yet, right? We know what the radical is, we got that guy, but we need to figure out what dx is. So let's take this original one, derivative of x is one dx. The derivative of five sine theta is five cosine theta, d theta. Now we can do the substitution. So the radical will become five, cosine of theta, and then dx will also become five cosine of theta, but with the d theta. 25 times two makes 50 out here. And I have cosine squared, which requires a power reducing formula. So we have one plus cosine of double my angle, since it's just a regular theta, when I double that, it'll be two theta. And I'm gonna take this two, since it's over both of the terms, I'm gonna just kick it out. 50 divided by two would make 25. Just because I'm cramped for time, I'm going to do a shortcut. So the integral of one d theta is just one theta. The integral of cosine is negative sine. But the u substitution part will require me to divide by that too. So if I let u equal to theta, then du would be two theta, right? Or two d theta. I can write it here, but I'm not gonna do it. So u equals two theta, 
and du would be two d theta. So d theta should have gotten replaced by du over two, which is why I have a two down here. I just didn't do the actual substitution and then the back substitution. Now we can't plug in the zero and the five yet because those were for X, right? And we do not have anything for sine of two theta. However, we do have trig functions and trig identities that tell us that sine of two theta is the same as two sine theta cosine theta. And then that would make these twos cancel out. And so when we go back to plug in for X, um, oh, I forgot to write theta. Um, theta is going to come from some manipulations because we have to get rid of the trig function. So you can take this relationship and basically solve for theta. So you get X over five. I could have done it with that equation too, but I would rather not have a radical. So that's why I took this other one, it's easier. And then if you want the sign to go over here, it becomes sign inverse. I think your book doesn't like sign inverse, it likes arc sign, but it's the same thing. I just know that in your book, when you're doing web sign, it wants this typed in, but since I'm gonna type it in my calculator, I'm gonna use this version, okay? So this theta is going to become sine inverse of x over five. Sine is what? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So here's my theta, opposite over hypotenuse. So x over five times adjacent over hypotenuse which is the radical over five. And now I should get that triangle in there. Now I should be able to plug in my five, get my zero, okay? So I'm gonna leave the 25 out here. When I plug in five, this is gonna be sine inverse of one. When I plug in five here, it's actually going to cancel with this, isn't it? And when I plug in five in there, it's going to become zero. What is zero times any of these things? This is a big fat zero, right? Now, when I plug in zero, I'm going to get sine inverse of zero minus. And when I plug in zero here, it's the same thing, right? Just because the factor is zero here, multiply by whatever, it's going to be zero. So sine inverse of one, let's see. Sine inverse should be pi over two, but let's go check. This is what my calculator tells me. And then somebody said, if you use the double arrow, it puts it right in the pi. I didn't know that. I always divided by pi and then converted it to a fraction, like the whole thing. <laughs> it was nice though. And then sine inverse is zero, that should be zero, but let's double check. Yes. So these two cancel, all I end up with is really much pi squared, isn't it? How did you get two pi? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. What should it have been? Two pi. Yeah. And that matches what I had over here on this paper. So they won't exactly cancel them, right? We're just going to have 25 pi over 2, and I don't know what that is. 25 pi over 2, it is 39.2. Oh, this one's got cascading going on. So let me show you my decimal. Um, this 9 is going to change that to a 10, which is going to change this to 27. So it's actually going to be 39270 when you round it to the nearest thousand. 
we care to go with that one. Um, yeah, that's what we got over here. Be careful with that one. I honestly don't think I saw any cascading arrows on um, the test. I really don't think there was Okay, now we're going to get into the decomp, and the decomp is going to be not as long as before because I kind of showed you how to use the calculator. And I definitely want to address before we leave how you're going to write that on your paper as far as like showing your work, right? Because it says to show the decomp condition. So how do you show it when you're using the calculator? I'll, I'll get into that, okay. Um, so let's see here, number 12. And I think this section is 8.5, the decomp. So it's three to four, and then we have 108X plus 108 over, x cubed minus 4x. So this is the problem for number 12. Um, so we definitely need some side work over here. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to factor that denominator. And I'm going to factor out an x. And then I would have x squared minus 4, right? which is x plus two and x minus two. So this is the whole thing factored out. If that were a plus four x, I would just have x times x squared plus four, right? Because x squared, the sum of squares doesn't factor only the difference of squares. So I'm gonna have three fractions in this case, something over x, another constant over this linear expression and then a third constant over this linear expression. Okay. And if I were to multiply by that common denominator with all three x, x plus two, and x minus two, um, what's going to happen is all three will cancel here. And over here, only the x would cancel, and I'd be stuck with a times the other two. Here, only the x plus 2 would cancel, and I'd be stuck with x times x minus 2. And then for the c, the x minus 2 would cancel, but I'd be stuck with x and x plus 2. Now, if you already see what's going on, you can set up your matrices right now. But for me, I'm actually going to have to distribute that. So this is x squared, I write it up here. This is x squared minus four, right? If you boil it all out and combine your like terms. So I'm just gonna distribute a to those two guys. And then here, I'm gonna treat this like bx and then distribute it. And then same thing, cx, distribute that. And so then when you set up your matrix, um, you're going to take the inverse here times the constant, okay? And then we'll figure out the answer to that, okay? And it'll basically be A, B, and C equal whatever it is you get. And so the top number will be the A, the middle number will be the B, and the bottom number will be the C, okay? This is what I'm using on your paper. I know you're putting it in your calculator. I just need to see what you put in your calculator and then what you got after you finished. Okay. So just tell me what you put in your calculator and then what you got when you finished. So for here, I'm going to do my uh, ABC. So we're going to do our ABC coefficients here, but we're going to do for x squared first, then for x, then for a constant. So for x squared, I have. Um, one A or B, I have one B, and for C, I have a positive one C right? for the X squared terms. For the X terms, I don't have any AX, so I'm going to put zero. 
I do have a negative two bx, so I'm going to type in negative two. And I have a positive two cx, so I'm going to type in positive two. Now for the constant, so no x's at all. I do have negative four a, so I type in negative four. I do not have any b's without any x's, so we're going to type in zero. And I do not have any c's without any x's, so we're going to type in zero. Okay. Now, what was the originals? The original x squared coefficient was one, right? The original x coefficient was 108, and the original constant was 108. And so what I want to do is I want to enter that into the calculator so I can compute and get my answer here for A, B, and C. So let's put this on the side and we'll mess with our calculator. So we're going to use this matrix button. We're going to go second and then the math button to get to our matrix. And I need to change my first matrix and my second matrix. This guy will be like A and this guy will be like B. Okay. So for matrix A, we're going to go to edit. And this is a three by three. So I need to enter three. And then for the number of columns, three. And then hit enter OK. We just go one, enter, one, enter, one, enter. Zero, negative two, enter, two, enter, negative four, enter, zero, and zero. And always just take a look before you like exit and make sure that what's in your calculator looks exactly like what you have on your paper. Once you confirm that it's the same, you can quit. So we'll do second and then mode button for quit. <coughs> Excuse me. It's water, but I'm not going to get it. We'll get some right now. So second matrix again, because now we need to enter this little guy. So we don't want to change what we had, right? Because we need both of them. So we want to go down to number two, but go to the right so that we can edit. Well, I guess I should have edited it first and then went down. But you want to make sure you're editing a different um, matrix, not the same, not this one. Now here I have only I have three rows, but I only have one column. So I'm going to hit three for rows, but I only have one column. And it should look like what you have on your paper. If it doesn't, you get the dimensions backwards, right? Um, you can just quit and try it again. I'm going to hit one, 108, and 108. And then that's exactly like I have. So I'm going to quit. And now I want to make it do A inverse B, okay? So that's what I want to do. I wanted to do matrix A inverse matrix B. How do I do that? Okay. You go matrix button again, and you're just going to hit enter where it says names. You're just going to hit enter because you want matrix A to pop up on your screen. Okay. So we're just going to hit enter. But I want that little inverse symbol. So we're going to go second matrix again and scoot over to map. So this is like all the things that you could do with your matrices. And the one I want is the inverse, right? So I'm going to Go down to inverse and hit enter. And then see how it pops up that little negative one guy. But I need B next to this. So we'll do second matrix and then go to B and hit enter. So it puts it on the screen. Now that all of that's in there, we're just going to hit enter. Practice this because the more and more you practice it, the faster you'll get it right. So definitely practice setting it up. Okay. And then if you need to replay the video, right? If you try to do it at home, watch the video again, there's little parts you can know how to put everything in there. Um, it gives me negative 27, negative 13, and 41. And if I did it over here algebraically, but I did get those same values. See how I got A negative 27, I got B negative 13, and I got C 41. Okay. So it does come out the same, right? Now that I have that, we can start running with this thing, right? So instead of writing this giant fraction, we're going to write these three fractions with these numbers on top. So we're going to have A 
So negative 27 over x plus negative 13 over x plus 2. And you could mess with the signs and all that if you wanted to. I'm just being very direct and putting it in there like exactly as it is. Okay. So I just put the negative 27 on top, the negative 13 on top, and then the 41 on top. From here, you can write the next step. You don't have to. Um, you could if you want to do this, it's not necessary. I mean, in, as far as time is concerned, I personally would not get over taking this test just because it wastes time, right? So I'm going to do it. So I just basically split them and took all of those numbers in the numerator and picked them out. And if you notice, you don't really need to do the use substitution, although that is what's happening, okay? This one matches what's in the note sheet. But as long as you have the denominators derivative in the numerator, you can apply that rule that says uh, the integral of du over u is ln of u. So the derivative of x plus two is one. The derivative of x minus two is one. And the derivative of x is one. So I have all my derivatives on top in my original golf file. So this will become ln of the absolute value of x, ln of the absolute value of x plus two, and ln of the absolute value of x minus two. There's no plus c because I do have balance. So you don't have to write this middle step, okay? If you can visualize it, you can go from here to here, right? Then when I plug in my fours and my threes, we'll see what we all get. So we'll get negative 27 um, ln of four and four is positive. So this, I don't need the bars. Here it would be four plus two, which is six. So I don't need the bars. Only if it's negative, it would have to turn positive, right? And then four minus two is two. I don't need bars. Minus negative 27 ln of three of five and of one. I know that this one, ln of one is just zero. So we don't really need to compute 41 times ln of one, right? We already know what it is. So let's get out of here, and do all this other stuff. ln of four minus 13, ln of six plus 41, ln of two. Negative and negative will be plus 27. Ln of three, and a negative and a negative will be plus 13 ln of five. And we get around 18.28, and the four will not change the one. So it's just 18.281. And that is what I have over here. So good with that one. There's not much writing on this one, but it is a lot of thinking, right? Especially when it comes to the setting up the matrix. If you prefer doing it the algebra way, that is totally okay. I'm honestly faster at doing it the algebraic way than I am at typing all this in the calculator, but that's just me. Okay. So you do it whatever works for you. Okay. If we do it the matrix way, you just want to see the what you put in like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, as long as you have this and then you tell me what you got, you're good. You don't even need to write ABC. You just write this equals and then your answer. Or better, the algebra. I don't know sometimes. Sure. Yeah. I think that's easier. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that agree with you. Which <laughs> is why I thought I should talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, it does help. Okay, we'll try another one. We'll get a little bit of practice. Um, and this is 8.5. Uh, 
Uh, I think for this one, I'm only gonna I'm gonna let you do it by yourself. I will do the matrix part and get these numbers, but I won't plug them back in and then do the problem. Okay, just because I know you can do this by yourself, and I need to get to the eight point six section or the eight point eight actually jump from eight point five to eight point eight. Um, the improper info so I can just show you how those deep look. Okay. So let me finish writing this problem. Now this one's like number 12. It just has like a pre-step. Before I can do everything I did in the orange, I have to do something else because here, this is an improper fraction, right? Your high power on the top is bigger than your high power at the bottom. So we do have to do um, our long division to try to simplify that. So if I were to do what times x squared would give me 2x cubed, it would be 2x, right? And then I distribute. So I get 2x cubed, negative 4x squared, and negative 160x. Then I would change all of my signs. So this would become negative, this would become positive, and positive. So 2x cubed minus 2x cubed means there's no more x cubes. Negative 4x squared plus 4x squared means there's no more x squares. And negative 159x plus 160x is going to be a positive 1x. And I do have to bring down my plus 53. Now, unfortunately, you can't, you're not supposed to get into fractions, but I can't multiply something by x squared and it goes down to x, right? It's not going to go down. Okay. So you cannot use anything else. This is it. This is as far as your division is going to go. So what happens is your problem becomes uh, what you got, your quotient, plus your remainder over your divisor, what you were divided by. And so then the partial fraction decomp has nothing to do with that guy. You're only breaking out this guy, okay? So you basically want to figure out, you're going to have 2x plus something plus something and then dx, okay? And you're about to figure out that decomp. And that's what I'm going to do over here on the side. We'll do the decomp for that. So if I take this and I factor that, I think it's x minus 10 and x plus 8. Do Yes. So then you'll get something over x minus 10 and something over x plus 8. Right? And if I multiply both sides of the equation or each fraction by that common denominator, here both of the denominators will cancel. Here, the x minus 10 would cancel, but I'd be stuck with a times x plus 8. And over here, the x plus 8 would cancel, but I'm stuck with b times x minus 10. Now, you might not need to distribute here, but if you do, that's okay. It's just one extra little bit. This one's a little bit easier to see than the other one. But I don't have x squared. So when I set up my matrix, I'm only going to be worried about coefficients for x and my constant. Okay. And I'll write the answer over here. Okay. So for x, I have a, 1a. I'm just going to type in the number 1, 1a for x, and 1b x. But for my constants, the terms with no x's, I have eight A's and I have negative 10 B's. So I need to type in that. And then I need to multiply by the original numbers. So the original coefficient of X is one and the original constant is 53. Oh, 
So we'll come over here and try to put that all in there. So we're going to do second matrix and I'm going to go to edit and I'm going to edit A, but it's only got two rows and two columns. So we'll have to go highlight two oops, and two. And it should look like this when you put in the template, right? So one, enter, one, enter, eight, enter, negative 10. And then I can quit, go back to matrix, edit. But this time I want to edit the other guy, B. And this one has two rows, but only one column. So two rows, one column. Okay. And it looks exactly like mine, right? One above the other. So I'm going to hit one, enter, 53. And if you've already done one, I don't think I'd give you more than one um, matrix problem or partial decomp problem. But if I do, if you already type that in there, all you have to do is go back up to it, copy it, and then automatically it will put in the new A and the new B. Okay. So you just have to go up to your calculator and copy. I don't have to go matrix A, matrix inverse, matrix B, right? You don't have to do all that again. And it gives me. I can even put the double arrow into fractions, 51 fractions. So it gives second, seven halves, and negative five halves. But then now we know this has a seven halves, this has a negative five halves, an x minus 10, and an x plus. I won't do the rest of it. I know you can integrate x, 2x, it's x squared. I know you can integrate that one and then integrate that one. It'll just be your numerator times ln of the denominator. Okay. And then it eventually evaluated from 12 to 4 or 4 to 12. Okay, but I'm gonna stop it right here just because I need to get some of <laughs> the other ones. Um number 14 is another partial decom. I'll leave an empty page. We'll come back to 14 if we have time. But I definitely want to talk about number 15. So number 15 is asking whether or not this improper integral converges or diverges. And so you do have to apply the definitions of the improper integrals. So wherever you see the infinities, you have to change them to the variables and write the limits. So for this kind of uh, improper integral, the bottom one's usually A and the top one's usually B. So the top is where I have my infinity, right? So I will say that B go to infinity and then replace the infinity with the B. And while I'm doing this, I'm also gonna rewrite this as X to the negative 20 just because I needed a power form and we're gonna apply the power rule. Then when I actually integrate this, I'm gonna get three times, if I add one to this exponent, I will get seven eighths. And then if I divide by seven eighths, that's the same as multiplying by reciprocal. And I will eventually still have to evaluate it from one to B. Now, you remember your limit rules from like how one, you can take your constant multipliers out of the limit because they won't be affected when you take the limit. So I can take 24 over seven outside if I wanted to, but I'm still doing X to the seven eighths from one to B. Now, when I apply that um, fundamental theorem of calculus, that's what I'm talking to Mr. Hussain, we will get B to the seven eighths minus one to the seven eighths. Now, if B is going to infinity and you have an infinite number raised to a positive power, it will just keep getting bigger and, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Very, very, very slowly, okay? 
that's different than when it has a negative exponent. When it has a negative exponent, the fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because the bottom is getting bigger and bigger. So this is not going to zero. It's actually going to infinity. And one to any power is one. It does not matter if I take infinity and I take out one number. It's still infinite. And it doesn't even matter if I take that infinite number and I multiply it by something, it's still infinite. Now these infinities are not the same infinities, but it is equal to an infinite number. When you get infinity, you say that the improper integral diverges. If you get the integral of whatever, whatever it is, I don't know what the thing is, or where the infinities are, but if you do the integral and you get a finite number, then you say that it converges, okay? So when you're doing it on the test, you're basically looking for that, okay? After I take the integral and I find my limit, do I get infinity or do I get a finite number? <clears throat> Even if it's like some decimal, like 0 0.2315, blah, 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 that's still a finite number. Okay. And so it would converge. If you get something with high in it, that's still a finite number. It'll converge. If you just get something five, again, it's a finite number, it'll converge. But if you get infinity or negative infinity, it diverges. Okay. Five minutes. <laughs> oh my God. Water. Um, so I think we can go to number 14 and maybe try to set it up. But we probably won't be able to finish it all. And I'm not sure if this is one of those ones that you might not be able to use a calculator, but I think you should <laughs> be able to use a calculator. So if I turbo over here on the side, here this one is proper, right? The big power on the top is smaller than the big power on the bottom. So I don't need to do the long division stuff. Um, but what I do need to do is factor that denominator. So I can factor out a common factor of x squared. And then that would leave me with x plus one. Now, the way you choose to deal with this x squared, there are two choices. Okay. One of them is a repeated linear. The other is to treat it as a quadratic. So you could do it both different ways and it will still come up with the same exact answer that comes. So this is what I mean when I say the set. So if I treat this as x being squared, I could write a over x and then b over x squared until I get to the power, which I have already. And then this is also linear, so it'll have a constant over x plus one. Or I could treat this as a quadratic and I would get a x plus b, a linear, over the x squared plus c over x plus one. These are exactly the same thing. Okay. If you were to multiply this fraction here on the top by x over x to get a common denominator, you would end up with a times x plus b over x squared. So they are the same thing. It's just which way did you set it up? Okay. I did this one on my paper, but I'm going to do this one. <laughs> so we get. Multiplying by the common denominator. This is the common denominator. Don't be multiplying all of these three together to get the common denominator, because then you get x cubed, and that's not the lowest common denominator. Okay, so make sure you're using this for the common denominator. But if I multiply everybody by this, they'll both cancel here. And over here, the x will cancel, but I'll still have an extra x and the x plus one. Here, the x squared will cancel, but I'll have b times x plus one. And then for c, only the x plus one will cancel. I'll still have the x squared. So 
So I have a x squared plus a x plus b x plus b plus c x squared. So for my x squared coefficients, I have one for a, I have no b x squared, and I have one c x squared. For the coefficients of x, I have one a, one b, and no c, c x, without the squared. For the constants, I have no a's, one b, and no c. And then the original coefficients were 15, 4, and negative 10. So let's see, matrix A. This is a 3 by 3 now. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then matrix B is three rows this time, but still only one column. And we have 15, four, and negative seven. And then since I already did this matrix thing, I'm just gonna highlight it and copy it and then hit enter. And we get 14, negative 10, and one. So now we have, and that's exactly what I got before. I mean, I did it algebraically, but I got A is 14, I got B is negative 10, and I got C is 1. So it does work if you do it this matrix way. Okay. I know I'm out of time. I'm just going to write this in here and then I'm done. I'm going to stop. Okay, we get 14 over this guy, plus negative 10 over that guy, plus one over this guy. Now, just FYI, these two will become the LNs, okay? Because if you take the 14 out, the derivative of X is one, and the derivative of X plus one is one. For this guy, you cannot do it because the derivative of X squared is two X and you don't have an X, okay? What you're going to have to do for this one is rewrite it like that and then use the power rule. Okay. For that one middle term, we're going to use the power rule. That's it. I'll stop. <laughs> if you, most of these problems you have solutions for, um, but if you want, if you're curious and you finish working out number, uh, what was it, 13 and 14, and you want to know if it, if it looks good, just let me know. You can send me a text and I'll tell you. Or you can just type in the number you get and see the hard way right, <laughs> whether it was right or wrong. But you can't ask before you put it in. Okay. I have one guy in the chat. Oh, okay. I just want to like speak. Well, if you don't have any other questions, um, if you think of them later, just make sure you message me. Okay. Other than that, guys, have a good day. I won't see you until Monday. So have a good break. Those of you on the remote, I won't see you guys until Wednesday. But make sure you take your test on Monday. Okay. Well, that's it. You guys have to win. And we have to take the test this weekend, right? Actually, let me see. That's a good question. I did put it online, right? Sure. I think I have the date. Friday. No, it's not Friday. I think I let y'all go on until the weekend. I just have to make sure because I haven't imported the test yet into your class. So once I do, it's due Sunday. And you can take it Friday. I'm going to make it available today. So as soon as I make it available, anytime between when I make it available today until Sunday, 11.59 p.m. Okay. So anytime between Wednesday and Sunday, you can take it. So and just make sure that if you're in the face-to-face uh, -face class, that you do download that lockdown browser. So if I go to your modules real quick, do uh, you have this little link right here? Make sure you click on that and then download the lockdown browser. Or you have it on my own. Yeah. And then you just open it when you're ready to take the test. You open it, 
and then you log in the canvas, all of that good stuff. Okay. Professor, did you already upload the videos and the questions? For today? Uh, or no, I thought we were going to take it on today. The test Trevor, that, Trevor, that was asking me. Um, I was asking if you had already uploaded the like the extra credit that we had talked about. Oh yes, no, I'm still waiting on my. I mean, it'll still be available and it'll still apply to test three, but I'm waiting on my coworker approving what I created. Um, as soon as he approves what I created, then I can I put it in canvas. But it'll it'll it'll, it'll we'll still have it even if it's not this week. If it's next week, it's okay. It'll still apply to test three. Oh, no worries. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. Thank you again, Professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and the extra credit's only for people who didn't make it to the seminar, correct? No, everyone. Oh, cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank sure. you. You're welcome. Have a good one. So I have a question that actually has nothing to do with calculus. Okay. Do you know how to do the box method? 